Almaty and Astana. Anyone uh, in Almaty or Astana? Please respond. Yeah, we've got Almaty. Hello. Yeah. Good. We can see you. We're happy to see you. Astana. Anyone? I think Mirror was there. Astana, are you with us? Okay, Uzbekistan, Tashkent. Anyone from Tashkent? Yeah, Tashkent welcomes you. Tashkent's here. Nurdin, are you in Tashkent right now? No, uh, I'm in Bishkek, and uh, well, somehow we heard that uh, you uh, were in Tashkent. No, you're in Bishkek. Okay, fine. Colleagues in Kiev, anyone from Kiev office? Yeah, we're here. Good. It's a pleasure to see you. We can see you. We can hear you. Colleagues from Minsk, are you with us? We welcome you wholeheartedly. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Yeah, the channel is okay. We can hear you. Moldova, anyone? Is Moldova here? In case you know. Uh, colleagues in Tajikistan, please switch off your microphone, please. Now, Moldova, are you with us? Moldova, Kishinev. Armenia, yeah, we saw Tigran. I think you are connected. Armenia, please respond. Yes, Stepan, we are with you. We can see you, we can hear you. Okay, good, welcome. Uh, and now our office in Brussels. Uh, is it connected? Do you hear us? Do you see us? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Colleagues uh, in Uzbekistan or Astana, I guess uh, these two sites are not with us, but let's hope they will join us later. Why don't we get started with our VC? Uh, we're going to hear uh, a most uh, exciting uh, report uh, from Brussels by Zvezda Vankova, who represents Migration Policy Group Belgium. And uh, she will speak about... Uh, Migrants integration uh, policy assessment for Armenia. Well, the report deals with Armenia, but not only. Uh, we sent out the uh, report to all of you, uh, and what is important is the methodology, the research approach taken by uh, our colleagues. As you realize, this methodology and this approach can be uh, applied in any country, and obviously MPG uh, would improve uh, the approaches based on your recommendations and your feedback. Uh, I think together we will be in a position to improve um, this uh, index and the methodology behind it. But I, I think it would be interesting to see where Armenia stands compared to other countries, how advanced in terms of uh, migrants' uh, integration and ad adaptation our colleagues in Armenia are. Now, let us get started with the presentation, and then we will continue with the Q&A. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to show our, our slides in English, and please use Russian version of uh, the PPT presentation. Коллеги, пожалуйста, микрофоны выключайте, иначе мы не сможем переводить нормально. Звезда, do you hear us? I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead with the presentation. Uh, you see the presentation? <laughs> right, we see it. Hello. Yes, okay. So if I'm uh, rushing 
too much could please the interpreters tell me to slow down. Well, I'll try my best to speak slowly. Hello. Okay, go ahead. From Brussels, I'm uh, Zvezda Vankova. I work for Immigration Policy Group on the Mi Migrant Integration Policy Index. And it's a pleasure for me to be here and to actually present you the um, results for Armenia that were presented in Armenia last October 2013. It was a MIPEDS assessment commissioned by the OICE office and the ODIR office. And um, it's a really interesting instrument, uh, as you said in your introduction, and I hope that uh, we can see more countries from the region being MIPEX, so we, ha we can have a better understanding of the integration policies in this region. Before I start with the assessment uh, of, of Armenia, I would like to tell you a little bit more about uh, Migration Policy Group. Uh, it's an um, independent policy think and do thing, as we call it, and it's existing for more than 20 years now. Um, its mission is lasting and positive change for open and inclusive societies, uh, better informed debate and action on migration, equality and diversity, but also greater European cooperation between and within sectors. What we do at MPG uh, is are mainly four activities. We establish expert networks, and uh, when I show you how many partners we have only in MIPEX, you'll see that it's, uh, these are worldwide ne expert networks. We also do compare and analyze policies. Uh, we engage more stakeholders at European level, but also through our expert network on national level. And we try to create uh, new opportunities for dialogue and mutual, mutual learning uh, and knowledge transfer through all the projects and instruments that we implement. So, what is MIPEX? A MIPEX, MIPEX is a research-based instrument to analyze, assess and improve immigrant integration policies. It benchmarks policies according to international minimum standards in order to identify countries' strengths and weaknesses. And when we say international minimum standards, I mean, we, we, uh, here we mean all the international conventions on migrants, but also the ones that we have at European level. Where we do not have international standards in some of the policy areas, we use policy recommendations by different international organizations, but also by different stakeholders and NGOs. Basically, what uh, MIPEX looks at and tries to measure is whether all residents, national, European, or non-European citizens, or as we call them from the European perspective, third country nationals, have equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities to become full members of society. MIPEX considers legal integration as first, but insufficient step to social integration. That's why it employs this rule of law basic approach to integration. And of course, last but not least, um, MIPEX is a web-based instrument which could easily serve as a public reference guide. It has a really, um, really good interface. We're working now on the, on the new version and it, it allows experts to look and to easily find information that's available for the different countries, but also compare different countries according to the different indicators that we have. And also, what I think is really important, it gives a really quick access to good practices. So if governments want to improve their integration policies, it's really easy to access this reference guide and to find good practices that could be adapted to the national context. Um, in order to assess how how um, how integrated and how integration works for third country nationals in the different countries that are part of uh, MIPEX, MIPEX looks at the pathways to which immigrants are turning into citizens. These will be the admission procedures, the residence pr procedures, and but, but also the citizenship procedures. It also uh, looks at uh, whether the countries are creating favorable conditions for uh, integration, whether third country national or migrants 
um, are treated equally, whether they have the same social, economic, cultural, civic rights, responsibilities and opportunities. And last but not least, it actually looks at policy outcomes and assesses whether all citizens and residents contribute and benefit from societal well-being on an equal footing, irrespective of their migration background. Um, we, uh, MIPEX have and covers seven policy areas for immigrant integration. You can see him. You can see them listed here: uh, labor markets, mobility, family unification. Oops, sorry. Uh, family unification, education, political participation, long-term residents or permanent residents, access to nationality, and anti-discrimination. Uh, soon we're going to have, we hope to have a health, migrant health strand. We are working together with the IOM and um, expert network called, called ADAP COST on the creation of a health, migrant health strand. So this will make um, the, the policy areas that we're looking at uh, eight. And now we have almost 40 countries that are assessed with MIPEX. We have all the EU member states, plus Norway, Switzerland, Canada, the US, we have Australia. Уважаемые коллеги, пожалуйста, микрофон выключите. Да, я не слышу, Please continue. Go ahead. Australia, but we also have uh, countries in Asia. We have Japan, South Korea. Then we recently mapped my text um, the Balkans. We have Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia. We have Turkey, but we also have Kazakhstan and Armenia. We are negotiating and soon probably will have a, a profile of Mexico, but also uh, we are negotiating with an organization in Ukraine, so we start probably will start very soon working on a Ukrainian um, profile as well. Just to give you an idea how the MIPES is structured as an instrument, it has it has seven strands, as I said, soon to be eight, and every strand has four different dimensions, totaling almost 150 indicators. So, for example, in the labor market mobility and in the uh, education, we are looking into the access, but also we are uh, we're, uh, looking at to the different um, policy measures available as part of the general support and also targeted support to uh, assist migrants to integrate better. For example, in the family reunion, uh, long-term residents and access to nationality are looking at eligibility, conditions for acquisition and security of status, but also the rights that are coming with the different statuses that the third country nations have access to. So basically, we are trying to assess whether uh, third country nationals have comparable working rights and opportunities like nationals to access jobs, to improve their skills on the labor market, whether they have rights to uh, reunite with their families, whether the children of immigrants are encouraged to achieve and develop in school like, uh, like all the children of the nationals in the countries whether they have access to long-term residence permits and uh, to nationality and can easily naturalize, whether their children born in the country are entitled to become full citizens, whether they can participate on an equal footing to, in the political life in the different countries, and also whether they have uh, effective legal protection from racial, ethnic, religious and nationality discrimination in the country that, where they are uh, living. Um, as I said, we have uh, almost uh, 150 indicators, uh, which are actually benchmarking the current laws and policies against the high standards in all these seven policy areas. The policy indicator is a question relating to a specific policy component from all these seven policy areas that I was talking about. So. Um, all these indicators are part of a questionnaire with approximately 200 questions. And for every policy measure or for every question, there are three uh, policy options or three answers. 
and the minimum and maximum score uh, is, is uh, between 1 and 3, depending on whether it's closer or further away from the report. А, коллеги в офисе все-таки выключите микрофоны, пожалуйста. А, коллеги там, где очень громко смеются, пожалуйста, выключите микрофон. Мы просто не знаем, в каком офисе вот, не отключен микрофон, но это очень мешает презентации и переводу. Okay. Can I continue? Звезда, please continue. Okay. So, <coughs> as I said, we have to be assigned a minimum or a maximum score between one and three, depending on whether. Звезда, sorry, sorry, no, they could not translate. А коллеги, в каком-то из офисов закройте двери и отключите микрофон, пожалуйста. Мы не знаем, в каком из офисов. А, да, в Армении вроде все выключено. В Бишкеке вы... Попробуйте еще раз все отключить микрофоны. Таджикистан, Да, отключите микрофон. Да, слышно. Отключите микрофон, пожалуйста, в Таджикистане. Сейчас, минуточку, минуточку. А сейчас слышно, Таджикистан? Да, сейчас слышно, к сожалению. Хорошо, но пока что дверь там закройте, чтобы никого был, не было слышно. Спасибо. А, звезда, please go ahead. So, uh, we are on methodology. So, the minimum and maximum score is assigned depending, uh, and it's between one and two, depending whether it's closer or further away from equal treatment. As I said in the beginning, equal treatment is a starting point of my text. <coughs> we'll find the maximum score. Uh, maximum score will be awarded when policies meet the highest standards for equal treatment. Score of two will be assigned when the uh, policies are being halfway to meeting the highest standards. Uh, and option three, uh, when they're furthest away from the highest standards. In order to make comparisons between all these different countries that we have MyTex so far, we are converting this scale of 1 to 3 into a, a scale of 0 to 100 scale, where 100 is the, is the top score. How is all this possible? Who gains all this machinery? Uh, We use, with, we, we use independent experts, we work with independent experts from the different countries who uh, fill in the questionnaire with all these 200 questions against publicly available and official sources. In the case of Armenia, this was uh, as of 1st of June 2013. So just to give an, uh, uh, another clarification, because a lot of people, are, um, a lot of people were questioning what exactly are we assessing. So these are laws and policies that are publicly available, and these are official sources. These are guidelines, policy guidelines. This will be different laws or bylaws. We do not survey uh, or take uh, expert opinion as a starting point. We, 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 our starting point are the policies on the books and the legal frameworks existing in the different countries. So basically, in, independent experts are checking the existing policies as of the date that the country is manifest. Uh, after the questionnaire is filled in, it's peer-reviewed once again and double-checked by independent experts. So we have a two-way of uh, two, two level of checking of the information that's gathered. And uh, this process is moderated by MPG's research coordinator, which in, in this case is me. Uh, so if there are any questions or ambiguities, the MPG moderates uh, this process and helps with national experts to assess the policies and choose the right option. And then what we do with this information, uh, as, it's, available, as uh, it's visible from our website, we present the results in a very short and sharp country profiles. So basically at a glance, you could easily see 
what are the problems and what are the, uh, the shortcomings in the country, but also what are its um, advantages and in the policies that are positively assessed. And before I, I um, start with the Armenian, uh, Armenian assessment, I just want to give you um, uh, an overview of the, um, the trends in Europe, which were assessed with MITEX3. Uh, usually countries are scoring uh, around the average, around 50%. And what, uh, what we could say about uh, all of the countries is that political will counts more than tradition. You could see that a lot of the countries who are new con which are new countries of immigration, um, uh, the policies are improving at a very, uh, very quick uh, pace because there is a political will to change the policies and actually to make them really effective. Also, what we see across Europe is that, um, is that where we have a European Union a key, when we have European Union law, uh, we have a really strong and similar policies because we have European standards and the European Union countries need to actually harmonize their national legislation with these European standards. And also we have a lot of candidates who also need to harmonize their national legislation with their key. This is what uh, our, our the results show in the Balkans who are applying for membership. So basically policies in the family unification, uh, concerning family unification, policies concerning uh, long-term residence or anti-discrimination are much similar and stronger because of the the uh, power of the EU law and the influence of the EU law. And also what we, what we could say for all the countries that are assessed with, uh, with some IPEX is that policy change comes slowly and step by step and unfortunately rarely based on data evaluations. So a lot of the policies unfortunately happen based on public opinion but not on evaluations. Uh, really thorough sound evaluations on the policies that exist and that are put in place. And now, the MIPEX assessment of, of Armenia, you could see the, um, the spider graph of, of Armenia, you could see that uh, uh, Armenia scores best uh, on family reunion and it scores 44 out of 100 points which means that Armenia has a legal framework, uh, which has legal framework which is halfway favorable for integration. It ranks alongside other new immigration countries in, in the MIPEX, such as Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, Serbia. It uh, provides uh, for, its, for the, the foreign, uh, foreign nationals who are um, present in its country uh, favorable policies, which are inclusive requirements for reunited families and permanent residents, for example, local voting rights for foreigners and acceptance of dual nationalities. These this are this is one of the positive um, uh, sides of the integration policies of Armenia. It also has several policy weaknesses, which are typical also for other new destination countries in, in Europe. For example, Armenia's policies are below international and uh, European legal standards uh, on family reunion and permanent residence procedures. As I said, here we have a standard on European level, so basically it's really easy to say and to see uh, where are the gaps in the Armenian legislation. What's also um, an area of weakness is the absence of immigrant consultative bodies, which is also typical for most of the new countries of immigration. There is an absence of a dedicated anti-discrimination law and independent equality agency, what's also um, a legal norm in the European Union because of the anti-discrimination directives that we have in place. And um, basically all these policies um, are slowly becoming much more favorable in several Central and Southern Eastern European countries because, as I said in the beginning, uh, political will counts more than, uh, than uh, tradition. So where there is a political will in the different countries, even though there are new countries of immigration, things are, are changing. As I said, family reunion is, uh, is the, has the, the highest score in Armenia. Um, 
reunited family reuniting families in Armenia can benefit from slightly favorable legal framework um, they benefit from uh, favorable eligibility and legal conditions as in several new immigration destinations in southern and central Europe temporary and permanent residence permit holders can apply for their close relatives they can reunite with their spouses, with their children, but also with their parents and with their siblings. The procedures that are regulated uh, in the Armenian law are short and low cost, which is also a very good, good uh, thing. And uh, reunited family members um, have equal rights as their sponsors. What's very important, they have access to autonomous residence permit, which means that they are not dependent on their on their sponsor if something happens. For example, if there is a divorce or if there is abuse, um, domestic violence, and they and the reunited reuniting family member have the access, has the access to permanent residence uh, after several years. What's uh, what's uh, a shortcoming here is that. Um, uh, unfortunately, the right of family reuni re reunion is not specifically specified in the Armenian law as it will be in most of the MIPEX countries. And what's a shortcoming here as well is that even though the procedures are short and low cost, there is a lot of uh, discretion for the authorities during the procedure. So a lot of in the, a lot of the cases, um, I mean, the administration could decide on a particular case without taking into account individual uh, facts uh, of the family and the, the family member who's applying. Second best policy is the long-term residence um, in in Armenia. It's um, generally uh, it's a generally slightly favor favorable legal framework, but unfortunately the status is reserved only for a few categories of, uh, of foreigners. So basically, this status is not accessible, and this is considered to be a major major weakness. Eligible migrants can apply after a short residence period, after three years, and again the procedure they go through is short and low cost, but again very discretionary. The reason why uh, it's very discretionary is that there is no legal guidance on the interpretation of the residence and subsistence requirements. So basically, again, the administration has wide discretion to decide on different cases during the procedure. Once the, the residents, the applicants actually uh, receive the status, uh, they have the same social and economic rights as Armenian nationals. But unfortunately, there are also notable excep exceptions, such as unemployment benefits and access to free voc vocational training and land ownership. And also, uh, what's a um, shortcoming here in this policy area and shortcoming in the Armenian law is that residence rights are slightly insecure, which means that um, foreigners have the right to short absence absences outside Armenia up to six months and they have few protections against uh, expulsion, which, um, which makes the, this, this status uh, slightly insecure compared to other countries. Labor market mobility. Here we, Armenia scores uh, 51 out of 100 points, um, which means that this policy uh, sets halfway favorable conditions for migrant workers to contribute to the economy because there are several gaps in the legislation. Um, migrants have favorable access to all sectors of the economy, especially self-employment. But, unfortunately, temporary migrant workers are not guaranteed equal access to the full labor market and also access to the public employment services. So basically, temporary migrant workers are excluded from this favorable access that the, the rest of the um, permit holders have. Also, uh, there are limits on the access to general support for, for uh, the other foreigners. Uh, they're not guaranteed access to free vocational um, training, for example, which means that they could be stuck in a, in a profession that's under their qualification. And also, um, foreigners pay two times as much as Armenian nationals uh, to actually uh, have their uh, to have their 
documentations and um, uh, diplomas recognized and their foreign qualifications recognized. So um, let's move to political participation. It's uh, the political participation uh, options for, uh, for foreigners in Armenia are only halfway to promoting the political to promote political participations. All foreigners uh, registered for at least six months can vote as local elections in uh, lo local elections, stand as candidates and join political parties which is going beyond many of the central and southeastern European countries. Uh, unfortunately, political liberties are not entirely favorable. Foreigners cannot be elected as party leaders or own a majority share in TV or radio companies. And also, as I said in the beginning, uh, the government does not structurally finance immigrant political associations or facilitate the um, uh, creation of uh, consultation mechanisms uh, for, uh, for policies which are relevant to the immigrants and immigrants can participate actively to actually have a say on the policies that are important in their everyday life. Access to nationality. Uh, immigrants in uh, Armenia face... Uh, sorry face slightly uncertain path to become un becoming Armenian citizens. Nationally pol nationality policies are less favorable for integration as in new immigration countries and uh, cent central and southeastern uh, Europe. What's uh, really positive is that dual nationality is accepted, uh, which is uh, becoming a trend in most of the migrant countries. But children born in the countries are not eligible to, to become citizens at birth, which is something that's not according to the most um, uh, most of the trends in, in the migrant countries. First generation immigrants can apply relatively quickly, but as in the case of the family unification procedures and long term procedures, they are um, uh, they face highly discretional uh, legal conditions and highly discretional procedure. Low protection, there is also low protection against involuntary loss of citizenship and statelessness, which is also something that's uh, a really um, a, a weak element of the policy to, uh, on nationality. Anti-discrimination, um, the biggest shortcoming here is that Armenia does not have a dedicated law and no specialized equality agency to protect residents from discrimination. Uh, so basically, um, foreigners rely on provisions that are uh, regulated in the constitutions, international law, and uh, vague equality clauses in, in few national laws. Um, and without a comp comprehensive law, uh, all these concepts that are really uh, complicated, the concepts of racial, ethnic, and religious nationality, and other forms of, of uh, discrimination are not defined, well defined, and not specifically prohibited in all areas of life. Also, enforcement mechanisms are only halfway favorable for enforcing this existing fragmented prohibition. Prohibitions. Uh, victims have access to civil, criminal, administrative courts, uh, which is a positive, uh, positive uh, fact. But um, all these discrimination cases are likely to be uh, ineffective without the specific anti-discrimination mechanisms that are lacking on, uh, on in, the, in Armenia. Potential victims must bring forward the case alone. They do not have any access to NGOs because NGOs have no legal role in the procedures and also without the help of a quality body which usually has a really big part in uh, the anti-discrimination procedure in most of the countries of the, in the European Union. And the last, last policy area which is scoring really bad, it's, it's, it has only five points out of hundred. This is education and education usually is an area of weakness for most of the migrant countries, especially in the new countries of immigration and south and center and southern uh, southeastern Europe. Uh, legal access uh, for migrant people to education is unfavorable because the, um, the Armenian law is silent on uh, immigrant peoples. 
Children are guaranteed right to compulsory education at least, but they will face additional fees to access vocational training and higher education. There is hardly any targeted support for immigrant people, so basically they cannot be supported for specific policy measures to advance um, in school. And the only measure that's available and that's targeted and more specific is the general tolerance course, which does not address the appreciation of immigrant uh, languages and cultures. So, um, for comparison, uh, most of the MIPEX countries, including Central and South Eastern European countries, would provide additional uh, tuition uh, for immigrant pupils in order for them to be able to master the official language in the country. Also, there will be additional training for, teacher at school, for teachers at school um, who are working with immigrant pupils, and also uh, there will be specific teachers training uh, on immigrants' needs and intercultural education, because these are uh, specific, specific uh, skills that they need, the teachers need to have. And um, also, um, in some of the new countries of immigration in, in Central and Southeastern Europe, uh, we'll see also su uh, support uh, for, the, for the teaching of immigrant languages and cultures during the school day, which is also uh, something that we consider being a uh, very good, good, good practice. Thank you very much. This was in a very short uh, and a brief uh, way of presenting the methodology of MIPEX and also the main results for Armenia. Now feel free to ask me questions. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Zvezda, uh, for this comprehensive and very interesting presentation. Uh, I would to uh, Armenia for their comments and uh, uh, their questions. Colleagues of Armenia, please, first your words, your comments, and then your questions. Okay, colleagues in Armenia, well, your questions and your comments uh, as you wish. Uh, thank you, Stepan. Uh, we do have some questions and comments. Uh, first, so I, I have such an impression that from this present presentation and from the results of this. I have kind of a, a dual, I would say, not quite, um, I cannot agree with all the results. You understand and everybody is aware that Armenia is not the country that accepts migrants, but rather sends migrants uh, to outside world. And uh, that probably determines uh, why we have a relatively large number of gaps in our uh, legislation to absorb migrants, uh, which is um, uh, clear from this presentation, but I'm still shocked and surprised that even looking at those relative numbers when we compare ourselves against some other countries, the countries that also are not the countries that would accept uh, uh, migrants but uh, uh, rather send migrants, uh, Armenia still is, uh, uh, it still compares rather negatively against them. This is uh, my surprise. Uh, this is my general comment. And uh, also I would like to uh, listen to some of the interpretation of some indicators like the like the voting rights. Uh, as far as I understand, in order to to elect, a, and especially to be elected, to be a candidate for the local elections, you have to be a citizen of Armenia. I mean, uh, residence rights will not uh, give you the eligibility to become a candidate uh, for the local uh, administration or government. So that's why I'm very surprised what kind of a legal document you were using to make such a conclusion that uh, immigrants can be actually elected. Well, here is my surprise. Maybe my colleagues also have some questions, I understand. Um, I have a question. I am Ursanova Boyan. I am, I am uh, working on the migration uh, projects and I work uh, on the uh, human traffic projects. Uh, first, uh, I, I haven't heard that this uh, uh, project was undertaken uh, in uh, jointly with the OSCE office uh, and with the human rights uh, 
uh, office of the OSCE. I wanted to add that uh, to what was said uh, in uh, terms of, uh, of Mirpal. Uh, Mirpal, uh, where uh, Russia is the main uh, country receiving most of the migrants from the point, that point of view, it would be really interesting to see the assessment of the Russian Federation and there uh, how it ranks uh, in terms of the migration absorption uh, and integration and uh, whether you have any plans to do that. Thank you, our uh, colleagues from Yerevan. And now, Zvezda, please provide answers and comments to what was said. First, um, I would like to I would like to react on your uh, negative um, uh, comments that Armenia scores really really bad, and I think this is not true because if you think about it, and as I said in the beginning, Armenia ranks alongside other new immigration countries, which on top of that already apply the European acquis or are um, you know, a candidate for European Union member states, they are actually harmonizing their, their um, legislation with the European acquis. And I think actually Armenia scores very well considered the fact that it's a new country of immigration and as you said, it still is rather a country of immigration and a country of transit and it still, um, still needs to develop and put in place immigration integration policies for the country nationals. So I do not agree that it scores really bad. I think it scores, it scores very well when you take into consideration that it's a new country of immigration. So I don't think 44 out of 100 points is that bad. This is the first one. The second one on political participation uh, and the rights to vote in local elections. The source is Article 2 of the Electoral Code, uh, which stipulates that persons not holding the citizenship of the Republic of Romania shall have the right to vote at local self-government elections in case, of, in case of being prior to the voting day registered for at least six months in the population register of the community where elections are held. And this is also supported by Article 30 of the Constitution. This, as I said, uh, when we present our um, results, we really work with the best and the brightest national experts, usually on local level, which are on top being peer-reviewed independently. And these results were already also presented in Armenia and Yerevan in October, and actually most of the national experts reacted very well to what they heard and agreed with the policy weaknesses that we, um, we emphasized. So um, I don't think there is a mistake. I, I think it's just um, probably not a really well-known fact, I would say, because, um, I mean, I, I don't know other instrument that presents in such a comprehensive way information for so many policy areas. Usually experts are specialized in one of the few policy areas, so they do not know everything what, uh, in, uh, what's, going, what's going on in the, in the different policy areas which are part of the integration process of, um, of the third country nationals. So um, I think that um, this makes it clear and answers your questions. On the third question regarding Russia and the Russian Federation, actually we would love to, uh, as I said, expand even more and do more mypexing in our in your region so actually I'm, I'm very much hoping that after uh, this uh, webinar and this presentation we can um, we can have a separate conversation discussing the po possibilities to mypex more countries including russia okay uh, many thanks with the uh, now, I uh, thank you, Zvezda. Now, colleagues from Belarus, please, in Minsk, your comments and your questions of Brussels, please. Okay, Minsk, it's your turn. Uh, First of all, uh, Mrs. Bankova, we want to appreciate your very informative uh, presentation. And this uh, MIPEX index is of interest uh, to us. And uh, 
And it's very important for us to have access to the serve uh, to the questionnaire itself to see what kind of questions did you include into your uh, into your questionnaire uh, do you have such do we have such a chance or, well, to have a look at your questionnaire and probably it is published on a website somewhere and our question is as follows well, who is answering the questionnaire is it the migration expert who is uh, expected to answer such a questionnaire who will analyze the labor market and the legislation and all those indicators, 148 indicators that you, uh, you need to explore? Or do you expect that first a team of experts is set up uh, to answer the question and only then uh, the peers would uh, analyze what they already answered. Uh, I wonder uh, how, what is the process? Uh, maybe we'll have some other questions as we go, but uh, we have uh, these questions to start with. Uh, at least these are the very first ones we need to start with. Thank you. Your questions. Uh, in every uh, country that's being assessed by MyPEX, you have a team of experts. And actually, you can, I will show you because I, I just opened the website. I can show you, you can see easily uh, who are the experts that work on the different uh, policy areas. For example, you could see in Armenia. Do you see? Are you able to see? Yes, we do. Yes, 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 we do. We do now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yes, for example, you can see who worked in Armenia, who are the experts, and also you could see the rest of our experts in the different countries. Usually, these are this is a team of experts. Most of them are experts on foreigners' law, on migration law, but we also have experts on anti-discrimination law or education, because these are specific areas. And as I said in the beginning, these are uh, we are adding a new policy trend on migrant health. So now we are working with an additional network of experts who are experts on migrant health. So that's why I said that, uh, I mean, the process of collecting data through our national experts, then peer reviewing the data ensures a uh, really good quality of the data and then, of course, fair assessment and comparisons from country to country. And uh, yes, about the questionnaire, uh, again, if you go to the website, uh, here under don downloads, you can uh, find the questionnaire with the full, uh, oops, sorry, you can find here all the MIPEX indicators, uh, you can find the MIPEX raw data with all the scores that were given to the different countries and also some of the, the comments that the national experts provided when they were answering uh, the questionnaire. Now we are working on a new edition of MyPEX, which will be presented in 2015. We are updating all the, all the policies that were assessed in 2010, and we will uh, improve very much the website, so we are working on that. Uh, also the indicators are we have several new indicators, so very soon uh, you'll be also able to see the new, uh, the new websites with the new data and with the new questionnaire. But um, you can, I mean, the questionnaire didn't change a lot, so you could still get the idea and you can still see how Armenia was assessed by looking at the indicators which are published here on this website. Okay. Uh, colleague of Belarus, Our colleagues from Belarus, do you have any other questions or clarifications to make? No, thank you. Now we understood how we can download the questionnaire, and we will certainly do that in the nearest uh, future. We would uh, like to assure you that from the comparative uh, point of view, this I index looks very attractive uh, to us. And, uh, wanted to learn from you whether you undertook any uh, survey on uh, Belarus uh, uh, using the MIPEX uh, instrument. 
No, we haven't we haven't done anything in Belarus, but we'll be more than happy to actually assess uh, these uh, policies. So usually uh, we either work through funding uh, which comes from European level or we work with the OIC, for example, and different international uh, international organizations who are supporting our efforts to MIPEX, to MIPEX to the different countries and their integration policies. Because actually this requires a, a lot of a lot of work and we need to recruit and be able to pay to different national experts to to do this uh, exercise which is really challenging and really interesting and uh, as I, I agree that it's a really um, really interesting um, instrument MIPEX so we would, would be more than happy to see it in action in, in your air region very soon okay. uh, thanks thank you very much well now probably our colleagues in Almaty in Kazakhstan have any uh, questions Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. Oh, do, we, do you hear us? Yes, yes, we do. Please go ahead. At this moment, uh, this information uh, uh, looks very uh, clear to us. Uh, we understand the approach to the assessment of the integration in Armenia. And uh, you were talking that such assessment was uh, undertaken in various countries, including Kazakhstan. Probably it was our misunderstanding, or what? Did you undertake it in Kazakhstan already? Yes, because yes, there is a mic assessment in Kazakhstan. It was commissioned by the OIC. Uh, and uh, can we find it on your website? Again, do you have such uh, assessment uh, published on your website? Yes, yes, we do have. It's just I can't open it now, but we do have an assessment. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Another question. Approximate number of uh, people who you surveyed in your, um, uh, in your survey. I mean, in general, how many, how many people uh, are usually captured by the survey? I mean, uh, who, uh, how many people are useful to answer the questionnaire? How many, how many people answer the questionnaire? normally when you do the mypex um, so as i said in the beginning the number of experts working on the different on the different policy strands varies from country to country and as i said you could see the different uh, experts under uh, about section about and you could see how many worked we do not survey people if this is your question, we, we assess existing policies as of, as of certain date. So basically, mm -hmm. we wouldn't go and um, do expert analysis or um, uh, rely on expert assessment. We will assess the publicly available policies and laws in, in a country, regulating all these entitlements and rights and legal frameworks regarding to the different integration policies. So if your question is about the, the team of experts, it varies. Usually it's four or five people having different qualifications. Or uh, if your question is regarding to survey, this is not a survey. It's, it's just a research-based instrument which looks into publicly available laws and policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Here is another question what about immigrants in Armenia. What countries normally do immigrants come from to Armenia? Um, 
As you could see on uh, the, the website, I just want to show you, but here there's some, something is wrong, yes. Largest countries of origin, here on the right, every profile, every MyPix profile gives, gives information at a glance about uh, migration statistics. So basically the largest country of origin um, for, for the for, for foreigners in the countries are uh, in Armenia are Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Russia, according to our national experts. And you could see also data uh, of, about the number of foreign born. Also, was the percentage as part of the population is around 10 percent, 11 percent almost. And also, uh, you could see women as part of the foreign born population. It's a really high percentage. It's not very very common. So basically, for every country that we assess, we try to also provide to our national experts data on migration statistics, and it's available on on the uh, on our website. Okay, Almata, еще пожалуйста. Almata, any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. On this case, let us move to the second site in Kazakhstan. That is Astana. Any comments, any questions? Please go ahead. Hello, let me introduce myself. I do not represent Kazakhstan. I'm Oleg Korneev, and I'm a fellow uh, at the Sheffield University in the UK. And here is my question. I wonder if you could uh, specify what is the difference and uh, major difference and advantage of MyPAX compared to migration profiles that used to be uh, done by IOM and ISPD. And a related question uh, with respect to uh, migration profiles produced by the National Migration Organization, the degree of government involvement was clear, but what is the degree of your interaction with government agencies when you produce your MIPEX index? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first major difference is that the migration profiles were, uh, which are produced by IOM mainly uh, in cooperation with the national governments, is that they look at the overall migration policies in the countries. And they focus not only on legal migration, but also undocumented migration, um, asylum, borders, I mean, a lot of, lot of other issues. Migration, a uh, migrant integration policy in this, or MIPEX, focuses mainly on integration. So actually, it assesses only the integration policies that are, that are in place in these seven policy areas that we discussed. So um, this is the main difference. Also, uh, the main advantage of MIPEX is that it's, uh, as I said in the beginning, it, it serves as a quick reference guide because uh, it compares in a very easy to use, short profiles, different countries from all over the world, so, and creates a rating. So actually countries who are lagging behind can easily see what the countries who are scoring the best do, what are the good practices that they apply on national level, what are the laws that they have in place, what are the legal frameworks or policy fr frameworks that facilitate integration for third country nationals. So um, I think uh, MyPix has an advantage because it's a comparative tool and, uh, and actually researchers, if they want to know more, of course they can do additional research, but they can see the comparisons at a glance, the comparisons are already there. As, as of uh, uh, compa uh, the migration profiles, I mean you need to read 40 migration profiles if you, if you have that much, I don't know how, how many they are in order to be able to, um, to uh, compare different countries. And also the, mig the mi uh, migration profile, they do not have uh, indexes. They do not have uh, actually um, the aim to compare or to assess. Uh, as far as I know, and I've read several in the past, uh, it's just a description of the policies that are in place and the problems uh, that are uh, faced by the, the government or the different third country nationals in the countries. And um, what was the third question? 
Now, to what extent you interact with government agencies when you develop MyPEX? How do you select your experts who work for you in designing MyPEX in each country? Thank you. Yes. So, basically, um, these experts, they are independent experts uh, who are not governmental officials or somehow related to the government or to the administration. Usually, as I said, um, MPG works with huge uh, expert, international expert networks. So basically, through our projects, we we have identified the people who are working in the different countries on this topic, who have a really good track record. They have a lot of publications. They're practitioners, for example, some of them. So uh, usually the recruitment of the experts is done through CVs and uh, the CVs are assessed and if they are uh, very well qualified, they have, um, they have broad experience on the topic and they are independent of the government, this is how we actually select them and invite them to work for us. And uh, as I said, the, the assessment is done independently from the government. If there are certain gaps in the legislation and we want to double check whether there is a policy which is our policy measure which is not publicly accessible, then the um, the experts could consult the government and ask them to provide an official source of information uh, describing or referring to this policy measure. But the government officials are not aware and information is not shared with them uh, regarding the scoring of the different policy measures and the assessment in general. Usually they are invited and uh, in the end of the, of the process when we present the country profiles and we discuss with them what are the shortcomings in a particular country or what are the uh, positive aspects of some of the policies, what can, can they do, what should they address, for example, what's not in compliance with the EU law if we're talking about EU countries or the international standards if we're talking about countries outside Europe. So basically, it's an independent assessment which is based on the publicly accessible policies and laws and it's done independently from the government. Okay, Astana, any further questions? Uh, Svetlana, International Migration Organization, Office in Kazakhstan. I've got two questions. First, I uh, know uh, your MIPEX report from, for Kazakhstan, and my questions are as follows. How uh, MIPEX could be applied in practice? We got to know whether in the future work governments would be using your data, would be considering your uh, recommendations and outcomes of analysis. I'm not talking about EU member countries. I'm talking about, say, Kazakhstan or other countries that are not EU members. So how uh, MIPEX could be applied to change uh, policies? Could you give us some examples as to how your reports influenced policies? And second question is, how do you select countries to be analyzed, to be looked at? Well, clearly, uh, looking at the countries uh, that you mentioned, countries that have been covered by you, well, those countries are very diverse. I mean, uh, you have uh, receiving countries, you have sending countries, and therefore the index would be different depending on a country. Uh, some sending countries uh, are faster to introduce international standards, they are faster to harmonize their national legislation, uh, providing a conducive environment for upholding migrants' uh, rights. On the other hand, in a different set of countries, it takes a lot of time to develop relevant legislation. On your first question, uh, I can here also speak uh, as a former national expert because I used to work as a national expert in Bulgaria, um, producing MyPEX and also raising awareness about its results as part of Open Society. This was my previous job. So I can tell you that when we presented MyPEX in Bulgaria, for example, we raised a lot of awareness 
about the, the, the problems that we have at, at stake. For example, we raised a lot of uh, pro, um, uh, we raised the issues of non-compliance with some of the directives. We raised awareness of, in front of, I mean, with the government, in front of the government officials. Also about the high fees that uh, migrant people need to pay in order to be able to access uh, the educational system. And on basis of the discussions we have with the national uh, with the national government, a lot of the amendments were introduced after after the um, the presentation of, of MIPEX. So I, actually, this is the one way to go. I mean, you could present the profiles, raise awareness, and then lobby the government for changes. This is one way to go. For example, a recent example from Malta was that uh, the gov government officials and NGOs just took the results of MIPEX from Malta and on the basis of the problems that you can see from the MIPEX analysis and the shortcomings, they started to actually uh, work on a new integration strategy for Malta. Because if you think about it, all these 150 indicators in the seven different policy areas actually are a, li a very comprehensive list of policy measures that you need to have in place in order to be able to provide facilitated integration process for the third country nationals that are in your country. So basically, this is a really good start for countries which are new countries of immigration or still uh, transit countries to know where to start, to know what kind of policies to put in place, to know what kind of policy uh, measures to put in place in the different policy, uh, policy trends. So that's why I think you could do a lot of different things in order to advance in countries and new countries of immigration. What we also do, uh, and we plan to do now on the Balkans, because we just had an assessment there, is to also design different trainings on the basis of the results of MIPEX in the different countries for policy officials or uh, state officials or NGOs or, I mean, all the different stakeholders that are involved in this process. So um, there are a lot of options. As I said, it also serves as a quick reference guide, so you have all the good practices in there uh, that you could actually get inspired by. You, could, you have all the measures that you need to have in place in order to facilitate integration. So I think probably based on the national context, you could either go for a variety of different uh, measures, well, for example, trainings and debates, or just lobby different government officials with some of the results. It's again, I mean, the national context and the different windows of opportunities that you have in your work with the government, I think, are the ones that are showing you the best way to go. But as I said, I mean, there is a variety of, of things that you can do with MIPEX and a lot of successful examples so far. Astana, please go on. Any further questions? Colleagues, Astana, any questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much then. And we move on to our next country. Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Hello once again. Um, after your presentation and uh, having looked at the data reflected in uh, your report, we realized that your data, your conclusions are in fact uh, the data that contain a lot of criticism. In fact, you identify uh, drawbacks and gaps in immigration policy, say for Armenia, you indicate that uh, there are some areas that should have been addressed in more uh, detail, and uh, you indicate that equal access to labor market is not always provided. So there seems to be a lot of criticism in your report. Now, I wonder to what extent your reports can be 
employed by the government and whether the government uses your reports at all or your reports are more like expert opinions that may be used by some stakeholders, say experts or NGOs. I do not think that the government uh, would be happy to use your reports and would say, oh, yeah, you are right, we've got some gaps, we've got some limitations here. My feeling is that your report is more of expert nature rather than uh, a true statistical report that could be used by government. Do you think, uh, your, uh, would you say that your reports are somewhat subjective? And once again, to what extent your reports are used by the uh, governments of the countries that have been through your uh, analysis? I just want to show you, but unfortunately the, the, the connection is not very good. You could see on uh, on the website again uh, how my, MyPix is being used, because we have a special section where it shows that actually MyPix is used by not only by national government, but also by international organizations and uh, and governments. And for example, the, the example that I gave with Malta, it's also online showing that this instrument, even though it also emphasizes the shortcomings, it's used. It's used by the government. As I said, this is not something that's based on expert opinion. This is an instrument that's based on research on the basis of the publicly available um, policies and laws compared with the highest international standards that you have in place. So basically, this is not a, just an expert opinion of a team of expert, national experts that say we consider that this is um, this policy is uh, not working properly because these policy measures are not put in place. This is all based on analysis of the legislation that's available in the particular country. That's why the subjective element is really, really limited. It's basically, uh, we have a straightforward indicators, we have a straightforward options on, from which you could choose on the basis of what you find on national level. So that's why it's not really an expert opinion, someone saying its opinion on the things that, uh, on the policies in, in the different countries. And um, yes, I mean, a lot of the, there are a lot of uh, uh, shortcomings that are emphasized, but there are a lot of good practices that are emphasized, and governments do use it because actually they could see, they, could, they want to score better in the MyPix ranking, and they want to see what actually the best scoring countries are doing in order to be on the top. So that's why this is part of the knowledge transfer and part of the advantages that the comparative research brings, being compared with the best ones, looking at the measures that are in place in the best countries, what's Sweden doing in order to score the best, what's Portugal doing in order to be the second best. And, um, that's why I think, even though there, there's criticism, this is good because this is the only way to actually facilitate, uh, to, to improve policies that are put in place and to actually uh, lay the foundations of a very sound, thorough integration policy on national level. So I don't think that, uh, that uh, governments are reacting uh, I mean, in a bad way to the criticism and not taking into account of, uh, all our uh, findings. Of course, there are always exceptions. But, for example, uh, again, on, based on my personal experience as a national expert, I can tell you that a lot of the things that we presented, um, the, national, uh, the national government already knew, and they were actually trying to find ways to change some of the policy areas. But there are also things that they didn't know, and they didn't know why some of the policy uh, measures were put in place. So actually, by raising awareness of all, all these um, uh, obstacles that the policies are creating, you're informing, you're actually giving a really um, important feedback to, to the government. And then, if there is a political will, of course, things can change, policies could improve. 
Also keep in mind that, as I said in the beginning, and now we are mapping also as part of the new edition of MIPEX, evaluation studies, whether they are evaluation studies evaluating the different integration policies in different countries and how are they done and what actually makes a good uh, evaluation study. And I should assure you that there are not a lot of evaluation studies. So basically governments lack a lot of this data, which is not only gathered by independent experts in this field, but it's also presented in a very accessible way, which actually can really give you information about how the policies that you have in place are functioning. And even though I'm presenting in a very concise way uh, the main uh, positive developments and shortcomings in Armenia, you, st you have 150 indicators uh, that are assessed, so actually you have much more information that could be used to improve policies. And I think it's a very valuable source of information. And the only one that uh, governments have sometimes in place and they could use. Uh, Bishkek, uh, let's go ahead. Any further questions? Thank you very much. No more questions. Thanks a lot, then. Uh, Moldova, Kishinev, your comments, your questions, please. Moldova, we cannot see you, we cannot hear you. Where are you? Okay, then, let us move to the next country, next site, that is Uzbekistan, Tashkent. Please, your comments, your questions. Uzbekistan, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you, we cannot see you. Well, we move on. Kiev. Colleagues, Ukraine, any questions, any feedback? Hello, I wonder how often do you update uh, your uh, outcomes? Uh, what is the frequency with which you perform your assessments? Um, the last uh, MIPE exhibition was done in 2010, and now we have um, updated edition in 2015, the beginning of 2015. What we try to do now, because I mean, until now we, we relied on uh, funding from the European Union, and also a lot of the countries which are outside the European Union would actually self fund uh, their participation in MIPEX, so it was really hard to update these policies. But from now on, what we are working on, we are introducing an ongoing updating process, which means that our expert network will need to inform us whenever they detect a policy or legal change, and we'll be able to actually update uh, on an ongoing basis all the different country profiles which are featured in, in, in MIPEX. So this is our really ambitious uh, goal. I mean, we are really uh, expanding, as you could see, not only in terms of countries that are included, but also in terms of uh, policy trends. Now we are adding a migrant health strand. We are um, exploring the feasibility of adding a housing strand. And we hope that uh, through our expert network, we'll be able to keep MIPEX updated on a regular basis through, uh, based on our own efforts and not on external funding from now on. But until now, we had an edition in 2007, edition in 2010, and now we have an edition in 2015, which will present the results as of 2014. Thank you very much. In the beginning of your presentation, you suggested that uh, currently you are in negotiations with Ukraine in doing an assessment, an organization in Ukraine. What kind of organization you had in mind? Uh, it's a non-government organization, but unfortunately the name slipped, into, slipped from my mind. I can, if you can contact me... Um, Later, to, I can I can I can send you the name of the organization. I just I just can't remember right now. Uh, 
Okay, distinguished colleagues, thank you all. Thank, uh, thank you very much uh, for a very exciting report. But as you may know, Ukraine has changed uh, its pivot. It's, uh, it intends to join the EU. And uh, would like to learn from you how uh, active we're supposed to be in pursuing such uh, uh, research and uh, how strict EU authorities are in terms of uh, complying with uh, respective standards. If so, we'd be happy if you could uh, engage our experts in this efforts. We have experts from the Institute of uh, Population present of this VC, so we'd like to see those experts engaged in this exercise because the entire uh, legislative framework in our country is in Ukrainian, and I think that uh, invitation of our experts uh, would be quite useful for us. We'd be happy to contribute to the work. Thank you very much. Okay, could you please contact me? At Fine. Uh, our, colleagues, our colleagues from the World Bank have my email address. So could you please contact me and I'll put you in touch with our Ukrainian partner. I'm really sorry that the, the name is out of my mind now. So I will put you in touch and you could discuss on local or national level how we could actually um, contribute or I mean, help each other. So um, this is what I can do. Just please contact me and uh, I'll put you in touch with our partner there. Uh. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, uh, distinguished colleagues from Kiev. Now let's move to Tajikistan. Uh, it is not just a uh, – well, I never intended to discriminate against Tajikistan. Uh, please go ahead. Dushanbe, any comments or questions? Well, uh, it seems that the technology is not cooperating in Tashkent or Dushanbe or Kishinev. Anyone from the three sites, could you please respond, for we cannot hear you, we cannot see you. Dear colleagues, uh, good morning. Well, these uh, the friends from Tajikistan are uh, online. A question is the federal policy in terms of the comprehensive requirements uh, to the family reunion and the right for uh, residents uh, and the uh, local voting rights to the immigrants and dual uh, citizenship. I want. Uh, uh, what, uh, country, uh, what country does Armenia have a dual citizenship agreement with? Uh, who does Armenia allow to have dual citizenship to? What country? Uh, basically, what we, um, uh, what we say and what we found out is that it's a lot, Armenian laws allow acceptance of dual nationality. So it's not on the basis of uh, bilateral agreements. It's regulated in law. So it's not a matter of uh, bilateral agreements, which is a, a good practice. It's, it's just part of part of the national legislation in Armenia. And what was the, your other question? We did not understand your answer quite right. We wonder whether Armenia has an agreement with any other country about dual citizenship. Maybe it's better to ask our friends from Yerevan. Maybe Yerevan uh, site has a better knowledge of uh, what bilateral agreements are there. The, the law on dual citizenship is not uh, uh, 
uh, about the uh, bilateral agreements. We're talking about the constitution of 2005. There were dual citizenship was allowed by our constitution. Before that, dual citizenship was not allowed. Like Armenian citizens were not allowed to have a citizenship from any other country. But uh, now, uh, technically speaking, every um, country that allows dual nationality for its citizenship would be able to have uh, a dual citizenship with Armenia. So, it, but again, it's not. It's beyond the uh, bilateral agreements. It's in our constitution. Zvezda, uh, do you want to add anything to this? And uh, this is what I said. And also uh, keeping in mind that we're talking about third country nationals here. So we're not talking about Armenian citizens who actually uh, have the right to do national, nationality. We're talking about third country nationals which are, who are residing in Armenia who have the right to actually keep their original nationality. And I agree with the Armenian colleagues. I mean, this is what I was saying. It's regulated in law. It does not, it does not uh, depend on bilateral agreements anymore. Okay. Colleagues uh, Dushan, do you have any questions or Any other questions, colleagues, or comments? Uh, dear Zvezda uh, Ivankova, uh, Vankova, and I have another question. What is the time uh, taken well, to, uh, uh, in order to implement MIPEX? My, my How long does it take usually to, to do MIPEX for, for a country? It really depends on the, the exports. Of course, if they're, as I said, we always strive to have the best and um, the brightest <laughs> in every country. But um, usually it requires probably three, four, five months because um, the gathering of information in the different countries is, uh, is different. I mean, sometimes you have the laws are codified, I mean, the integration policies are codified, it's really easy. Sometimes the norms are dispersed in different laws and policies. So basically, it's one or two months to gather the information, one month to peer review, and then several weeks to write the profile and uh, insert it into the website, upload it on the website. But of course, this varies from country to country. Creating the baseline is, uh, takes probably three, four months on average. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from Dushan Bay, Tajikistan? Uh, dear colleagues, I looked through the results of the MIPEX assessment and I wanted to ask a question before I would ask another question. I'd like to comment on some uh, uh, of the presentation uh, slides. I understood that many conclusions that are made uh, and many of the strands used by uh, the migration, that everything is actually quoted from the uh, uh, laws that uh, had any reference or any relevance for the migrants' position in any country. And uh, we you know that very often many issues are beyond those uh, things that are usually quoted in the migration laws. Uh, and I wonder, when uh, your peer experts, do they actually also monitor the practical implementation of such laws? Because sometimes practice may be different from what the law requires. I, uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, MIPEX uh, looks at the laws and policies only. Of course, there are some of the indicators which will assess the implementation. But the main aim of MIPEX is not to assess the implementation. It's just to map the legal framework and to present that to the different actors and researchers and policymakers to actually do their own analysis and implementation. Because um, 
And yeah, I agree that especially in our countries, the gap between the legal framework and the implementation is, big, is really big and it could actually really um, differ from what's on the books. But this is left to the competence of the, um, I mean, the different users of MyPix. For example, there are a lot of our experts who, based on the MyPix results, do additional analysis on implementation of, those, of all these measures that are put in place, and then, uh, I mean, use this result to raise awareness about uh, about the possibilities that the legal frameworks uh, have uh, put in place, but and also that they're not used in the proper way, or they're, I mean, due to administrative discretion, not used in the proper way. So yeah, as far as we can, we we um, show information on implementation, but um, this is not the main aim of of, of my case. The main aim is to actually map the, the publicly accessible laws and policies and the framework. And actually, as I said in the beginning, this is our rule of law approach. А, пожалуйста, еще в Душанбе. Ваш вопрос. Окей, Душанбе, any other questions, please? Thank you for such a useful answer. I would like to also to uh, add something to my question. I wanted to check about the Central Asia, about the post-Soviet countries. Where are some other countries where you undertook this research? And uh, I mean, any other countries from the uh, uh, post, uh, I mean, our former Soviet Union countries, which countries were assessed and what are the countries you plan to assess in the near future? Thank you. As I said in the beginning, we've only assessed Armenia and Kazakhstan, and this was commissioned by the OSCE and ODIR. So basically, they, uh, the, the governments of this country asked uh, OSCE and ODIR to undertake this assessment together with us. We would love to see more countries migrants in this region, but of course, this is just uh, this is uh, open to negotiation and to um, I mean, if you're willing to support us, and the World Bank is willing to support us in this endeavor. Of course, we are really open and we can do that. We don't have particular plans because I mean it's again a matter of funding, but we are willing to do that. We have the experts in place, so. It's just a matter of uh, additional conversation and some uh, and, and reaching an agreement. As I said, with Ukraine will be the next one. Uh, we we are negotiating and we are. I mean, we have also a team in place and they are ready to start the updating so the, the the creation of the baseline. So I think this will be it uh, for now. But if you're um, if you're interested, we can have separate conversations and just discuss possibilities for my mixing of your countries. So I mean, don't hesitate to contact me, and we can schedule a additional meeting or Skype calls and discuss how we can actually work together to map small countries from the former Soviet Union. Dushanbe, uh, еще Dushanbe again, any other, any more questions or comments or considerations? I understand there are no more questions from Dushanbe. We still do not have a line established with Uzbekistan and Moldova. Therefore, we'll have to transition to the Russian uh, side. Uh, probably I will abuse my uh, uh, powers at this point, and uh, I will ask my question first of Zvezda. Since I'm an economist with some mathematical background, my question is as follows. Well, how do you arrive at those scores if you're in your index uh, where you arrive eventually? Like uh, you have about seven strands there or seven areas, and uh, what kind of weights do you uh, attach? 
attached to those um, strands or areas, and you have some subcategories there as well, or do you use any interval assessments or evaluations, and going from interval to interval, you arrive at some uh, uh, evaluations or uh, scores, uh, your quantitative, uh, how do you uh, arrive at your quantitative assessments? Uh, would you please explore on this algorithm, please? Um, thank you. It's a really simple, it's a really simple uh, method. It's basically MIPEX uses averages. So uh, it averages the different policies, policy elements that are weighted in the same way. And then it averages them for a particular dimension. That and afterwards it averages the four uh, dimensions, and this is how it actually comes to the final score for the MIPEX uh, for the for a country that's MIPEX. And you could see the different scores and averages online again. I mean, as, as I showed in at some point, there's the raw data file which is which is uh, available under the download section. But uh, do you think this is the correct approach that all subcomponents are given the same weights? Uh, because some may be more important, others are less critical. I mean, this is, uh, this is again something that's of a national priority. In some countries, maybe a, a particular area could be more, more important than another one. But it's just for the for the uh, different national actors to do their uh, additional analysis and actually to come up with another assessment. We can't really take the priority on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the national national governments. So that's why we've chosen a, this approach to actually uh, give the same weight to different policy measures because we believe that these are all important. Of course, as I said, the different different governments can have different uh, uh, different approach and different weighting of the different policies. But this is again uh, a matter of additional analysis, which was, should be done at national level. And this is a, this is the way uh, an international comparative tool works, in our opinion. Okay, many thanks. Uh, uh, now, colleagues in Moscow, maybe you have some additional questions, comments, considerations. Uh, no. Um, well, this uh, methodology is of great interest for many countries and especially for Russia where we have a special uh, program for resettlement of uh, Russian uh, nationals who lived outside Russia for a long time, and uh, they are now coming back, and we need uh, to give them, them some time for integration in the society. But Russia being a recipient country, we have a lot of labor migrants in the country. I wonder whether in your work you, ex you used this index, index to see how uh, those labor uh, migrants um, adapt to the country because uh, we understand integration is the last, last stage, but before they have to adapt to a recipient country. Do you have anything about the adaptation of migrants? Uh, uh, not uh, integration, but adaptation of migrants. Thank you. We don't really make a difference between adaptation and integration. I think uh, what uh, I presented and what we talked about, these are all different stages of the integration process of, uh, of the um, migrants and third country nationals in this in the new countries of uh, and in the, their new host countries so basically uh, I don't know what do you mean by adaptation but uh, you have what we have and what we assess are different targeted measures that actually provide specific uh, tools uh, specific measures for migrants to integrate in the different in the different um, uh, countries for example uh, let's say let's give you an example labor market mobility for example a targeted measure will be a specific uh, procedure for recognition of foreign qualifications or um, access to apprenticeship or um, a language course that it's uh, on the job and helps migrants to um, to uh, easily adapt to the new circumstances in the in the new country. So is, is this what you mean by adaptation? Uh, 
Let me explain why I raised this issue. We now uh, drafted a law that is targeting the adaptation of uh, and integration of migrants. And we're talking about the two stages there. The first stage is adaptation of migrants, and the second stage is in the integration of migrants. And based on this, uh, I asked my question, may I answer this question? This is an answer from the Russian Federation. I explored the methodology of MIPEX uh, in depth, and I was trying to apply it to Russia. And what I discovered for myself, this the difference of uh, interpretation of what is meant by integration. MIPEX uh, treats uh, uh, integration as the provision of uh, some illegal opportunities to the migrants, to have migrants enjoying the same rights as uh, uh, nationals in the country. And the major principle of integration is to have as much uh, equality and equity as possible. In our case, it's different. Uh, what we mean by adaptation, we're talking about the Russian language courses, about some other things that make the life of uh, labor migrants easy in Russia. And as I told you before, well, every area of, uh, every indicator of uh, MIPEX uh, or 148 uh, indicators is actually uh, a specific question. For example, if uh, uh, there is an open access to the guidelines on how one can pass an exam in order to become naturalized, uh, like uh, uh, we're talking about the open access to such a document that every migrant if uh, that migrant decides to become a national, uh, would be able to know how he would uh, pass such an exam and what qualifications he should meet. Uh, and depending on what is the answer, you will have three options. Uh, and that's how you, the country is assessed. All that should be spelled out in the law. And from that point of view, uh, MIPEX looks at the law as an integration instrument. So we, uh, MIPEX looks into the following, like uh, whether the uh, law, the legal framework provides for this integration. And uh, now, as a follow-up to my comment, I would like to ask, to ask a question. As far as I understand, the uh, MIPEX was uh, developed to assess the European Union countries. Uh, and the logic was quite clear, like every country there should follow the same directives or guidelines, and uh, they see the progress of those countries. Then the MIPEX was applied to the countries that are outside the EU domain, but uh, still, uh, since those uh, standards of the EU are quite high, why not to expect the other countries to comply with those countries? But look, many countries that are not migrant recipient countries uh, were captured by those index. Uh, like we're talking about the Armenian, you are talking about the new country of immigration. What do you mean by new immigration? What is the principle by which you refer those countries to being uh, the new immigration countries category? Thank you. Um, what we mean by new countries of immigration is usually countries which used to be countries of immigration and transit countries which actually very quickly developed to uh, change this pattern and now are recipients of immigrants. The best example for that, the best example for that, for example, is uh, Spain and Portugal are new, considered to be new countries of immigration, but also uh, for example, Bulgaria and some of the Balkan countries which became part of the European Union and are slowly changing their profile from countries that used to be countries of immigration and transit to countries which are starting to receive migrants. So basically, I think the best uh, way to define which country is a new country of immigration is to look at the statistics, to the migration statistics and to see uh, what are the tendencies in the different countries. If they're, they're actually starting to slow down the immigration processes, but uh, are receiving more and more migrants, this makes them, this turns them into new countries of immigration, versus you have traditional countries of immigration as Australia, as the US, as Canada. So this is just to make, to make a distinction, and it's all based on the migration statistics that you have in, in place.
Спасибо. У меня возникла такая мысль, что возможно... And I wonder whether you would uh, concur with it. May we develop such an uh, index for the countries that send migrants? Uh, if we assess the countries from the point of view how uh, they set up conditions for the uh, for, to host uh, uh, migrants, but look, uh, the countries who send migrants should also be responsible for something, because they should also support their people who are seeking employment and or whatever in some other countries. Uh, did you think about this, that probably we should develop the index for the countries who send migrants rather than the countries who ac receive migrants? about immigration in this case. So basically we always look from the perspective of the host country. We assess the policies in the host country, whether the host country has all these policies in place which will facilitate integration or adaptation or whatever we will call it of, of third country nationals. We do not have, um, uh, we do not plan to assess countries who are, which are actually countries of immigration to assess I mean, their policies regarding the, the immigration processes. What we may do in future, and we are thinking about that and we are discussing it, is to actually group countries in different, um, different categories and actually have countries which are new countries of immigration being put in one category or countries of, which are of tra traditional countries of immigration in another category. So this is something that we consider, but this won't change the methodology. We'll just change actually the rating system and the uh, the way that MyPix, uh, the MyPix website presents the different ratings of the different countries. But uh, we don't plan to deal with immigration. It's not part of, of the policy of the, the aim of MyPix. Спасибо. А, спасибо. Еще вопросы в комнате. Thank you. Any other questions from the Russian uh, team? Yes, my name is Juan Gutierrez. I'm a consultant uh, with the Mirpal project. And I actually have a couple of comments going back to what was discussed with uh, the weighted composition of the index and so on and so forth. Um, when I was in Belgium, I worked with Fletic, working on how the World Economic Forum develops its uh, global competitiveness index. And it reminds me a lot of this effort, because it's a tool that is used for cross-country comparison. And um, basically, a couple of suggestions now that we're pointing that uh, uh, countries have gaps and uh, little places where to improve. Maybe the MyPEX um, tool could be improved by adding a certain weighted category to it. Um, for example, with regards to the kind of policies that facilitate other policies for integration. For example, language courses. Uh, for labor mobility category, that would be uh, uh, greatly improved if uh, the language uh, is uh, higher or lower uh, as compared to, for example, qualifications, because sometimes qualifications of migrants are achieved in the country where they are uh, currently residing. Therefore, maybe one is more important than another. Just, just to use an example. And also, I think that the methodology would be greatly benefited from uh, the idea of uh, this um, theory-practice gap. Uh, they, they, they say that, in theory, theory and practice are equal, except in practice. So uh, this is a case, for example, in Spain, where uh, in the law, the deportation, express deportation of uh, illegal immigrants at the border is not allowed, but in practice, it's done in the North of Africa border. Or, as we were saying, uh, in Armenia, the law says that uh, immigrants can participate in local elections as candidates, but since nobody knows, uh, it's not taken into consideration. Um, in the World Economic Forum, we kind of solve this through a set of questionnaires uh, towards businessmen, and we add it. Uh, do you know, um, you know, this kind of figures exist in their country or not? Are these figures uh, carried out or not in your country? 
and, and so on and so forth. And in a Likert scale from one to seven, people you know, can, can attach this information into the index. I don't think it would alter the, the goal of the index. I don't think it would alter the composition even of the index. But I think it would give a much clearer image of, one the, of, of what the index is uh, purporting to present as a tool for uh, usage in different countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Uh, uh, we have just five mi I mean, minutes yeah, left. <laughs> yeah, I also <laughs> don't have a lot of time left. Thank you, yes. Um, um, there is a really a big team of academics and researchers that actually created Mitrix. And I think they assessed all these different options that, uh, that you mentioned and decided to actually do it this way. So I don't think that, um, I mean, of course, the MyPix, could con uh, the MyPix index could continue to improve, but uh, I don't think that uh, we are able to um, to include implementation indexes, because I mean, it's already very complicated and really hard to update. So I think that, uh, and it already includes some of the, some of indicators, some indicators that are trying to assess implementation. So I don't think that, uh, of course, I'll share your um, your ideas with our team, but I think that um, we've done it all already several times, and it turns out to be a really good instrument, of course, mainly focusing on, on the legal frameworks and policy frameworks. And as I said, different actors using, using MyPEX can add different value to it. You can easily do uh, analysis of implementation, you can make a comparison with the best, you can uh, check the legal frameworks uh, of, of, of the international standards. So basically, um, there is a lot of information that could be used by the different actors, and it cannot all of it pre be presented and, uh, and be accessible as we strive to do with our analysis. Yeah, sort so of actually, the uh, it provides much more that it's visible on the surface, uh, I think. And if you take a look at the questionnaire, you'll see that there is a, there are some indicators trying to assess also implementation. So um, thank you for thank you for your feedback. We'll discuss it with our team, but I think this is the method methodology that we've um, we've chosen to to use, and it proved very successful so far. Uh, just last comment. Uh, thank you for for that. But what I meant is that by doing this, you place a burden of you of uh, the interpretation of the theory gap uh, of the theory practice gap on the user. But it kind of defeats a purpose for comparison because then only the person who lives in that country will know the theory practice gap and will adjust his expectations for the local market. While comparatively, that won't be useful, uh, and that's why. This additional value would, uh, this additional question integrated in the index would have an additional value. That was just my my comment. Uh, thank you very much. I think well, well, something that you do not take into consideration is that uh, it's very, it's already very hard to collect all this data to assess the policy and legal framework that should be pu publicly accessible. And when it comes to implementation, this is even harder, and this information usually is not available. So this is where we'll actually have, we have a problem and we need to rely mainly on expert analysis and expert opinion, which I said is not the method that we use. So this is one of the problems that we have with implementation. Yeah, I agree that if we talk about comparability, this creates a problem, but from a methodological point of view, if you don't have if you don't have data on the basis of which to assess the implementation of policies, then we have a methodological problem, and we need to rely on expert opinion mainly, especially in the countries of our in our region. I mean, this, the information is really scarce. As I said, there is no evaluation. So how how if there is no evaluation, how do you then fill in uh, the indicators for implementation? Okay, we have just one minute uh, left for Dmitry Politev. I've got a brief question. I wonder if you take into account some sectoral norms and uh, letters uh, specifying some provisions, not just laws and major policies, but some sectoral or ministerial ordinances or decrees. Do you consider them? 
внутриведомственное. Thanks.